Um, and, oh, that's much better. And uh, so the data was, uh, was collected mainly in August. And so we've just had the data after cleaning and entering, et cetera, for, for just a few weeks. And so we've been trying to produce some initial results from it. Um, so I'm going to uh, provide a little bit of background about the cost, labor cost pressures that are facing firms in China. Pretty well known, but uh, I'm going to just present some, some facts about that. And then I'm going to introduce the survey uh, that we've done, provide some descriptive evidence on, on this question about how uh, firms are responding to the rising uh, wage, wages in the, in the region, uh, focusing especially on employment adjustments in the firms, um, and then do, uh, present some results from uh, some initial regression analysis, and then uh, conclude. So hopefully I can do it in uh, a very short time. OK, so um, this is a paper from a review article in the Journal of Economic Perspectives by one of the co-PIs of our big project, uh, the survey project, uh, uh, Li Hongbin. And um, you can see that uh, starting really in the 2000s, we start to see this uh, almost convexity in the rate of uh, wage increase in, in China. Um, and Part of what's driving this is demographic trends. Uh, so another paper, um, De Young's presentation pointed out uh, yesterday that uh, the size of the absolute size of the Chinese workforce is now starting to decline. Um, and so negative rates of growth in absolute terms. And that's also corresponding with a rapid aging of the population. If we look at manufacturing wages, this is uh, official data on a average wages in manufacturing. Um, and you can see that from 2007 to 2014, the real wage controlling for CPI has just about doubled. Okay, So this is a, a pretty rapid and strong force that firms have to deal with. Uh, if we look at the relative wage of unskilled workers, which I'm proxying here um, by uh, combining some data on the wages of migrant workers, so rural migrant workers in China, and kind of formal uh, uh, workers in the urban sector, you can see that the relative wage uh, was declining until about, again, this 2007 point. This is just pre-crisis and then has been increasing steadily since. So uh, over the past 10 years or so, the wages of unskilled workers have been growing at a faster rate than skilled workers, reversing a previous trend, a pattern from, from the earlier period. OK, so the question uh, that a lot of people are worried about in China and in Guangdong province in particular are how to respond to these uh, rising labor costs, especially for unskilled labor, and of course how uh, industry in China responds to this challenge will inform kind of the nature of structural change, whether China is going to kind of get out of the whole industrial production um, sector and move to other services or other, or whether it can manage to actually upgrade technologies uh, in the sector or move to higher value added uh, products, et cetera, um, and speaks to these issues of uh, the dynamics of comparative advantage, can they respond to shifting relative prices quickly? And can they anticipate these problems? So these are issues you know, which uh, Yong and uh, Justin have been uh, emphasizing for some time. And of course, there are many possible responses to these challenges. Uh, the one that occurs, especially for many Hong Kong invested firms in Guangdong, is to just shut down, to exit, be happy with 15 or 20 years of excellent profits and go on to something else, or to downsize or get out of activities that are not uh, profitable and just continue in, in areas that you, you can continue to make profits. But that's kind of a negative outcome, I mean, you might say, in especially in terms of uh, con continuing to contribute to employment creation and growth. There's more neutral types of outcomes where maybe you can relocate within China or from the from the standpoint of businesses, even outside of China. So you can move horizontally, keep producing, make, keep making profits, find lower wages or other uh, lower costs and other aspects. And then I think there's this view that there's a more positive uh, scenario 
of upgrading through new products, shifting to more capital or skill intensive production technologies, so that all of this, all of this managerial investment in, in running businesses isn't kind of lost, right? And that you can continue to create jobs that are more appropriate for the new relative supply of skilled workers and the new relative prices that firms are facing. And so being able to respond in a positive way does require, obviously, flexibility. And, and there are many, many intermediate factors which are going to affect the ability of firms to respond. And uh, although we can write down simple economic models where you know, the response uh, is, occurs very naturally, in practice, many countries really struggle uh, with upgrading. Um, and, and this is the whole middle income trap idea, perhaps. Um, but it's very hard to kind of rise. It, it may create, it may require a whole different set of institutions, in fact, to uh, go from you know, producing labor intensive exports to really moving to higher value added um, in, uh, subsectors of industry, okay, or services. Um, and so it also may depend on a number of firm characteristics. And so uh, our original research proposal tried to uh, argue that we would try to study these outcomes and also try to understand what were the key factors that were affecting the ability of firms to respond uh, to these rising cost pressures. OK, and uh, it's hard to study these issues using most firm data sets because typically firm data has very poor information on workers and labor. Typically, you only have total employment and the wage bill, as in, as in the Indian data. Um, and that's also true for most of the Chinese data. The census data has information on um, skills of the labor force, but not, doesn't have any information on wages. So it's also very limited. And of course, those only occur every so often. Um, so uh, also, uh, if we're trying to understand at the regional level how wage differences are affecting firm response, there's also a problem in the wage data in that typically uh, the mean wage changes in a particular area, even in a firm, if it's just ma measured in some average way, is going to embody not just a true wage pressure change, but also embody compositional changes in the labor force in those regions, right? Different skill as hi you know, hiring and firing takes place. Okay, so that's kind of motivation for one of, I think, for the strong uh, advantage of collecting your own data. And um, for this data set in particular, which we call the China Employer Employee Survey, that's a bit ambitious, of course, because we only did the survey in one province. So it's not a China survey yet. Um, it was, as I mentioned, done this past summer. And we surveyed 570 manufacturing firms uh, located in 20 different county level districts and 13 cities in Guangdong province. And so it's a representative sample of uh, industrial firms, manufacturing firms, where the sampling frame was the recent 2013 economic census, um, which surveys every um, operating manufacturing firm in the province. And we restricted the sampling to firms that had at least 25 workers. So we excluded the very small firms, uh, which I think account for something like 10 or 15 percent of total employment. Um, uh, and then in each uh, firm, we asked uh, the firm's uh, personnel department to provide a list of all of the employees in the firm, and then we randomly sampled. Uh, where we stratify, we sampled at least three managers in each firm, and then the other seven uh, workers uh, was randomly sampled. So for most firms, we sampled 10 workers in the firm. Um, and if the firms were smaller, we scaled down to a minimum of six workers uh, in a firm. And this is a collaboration with uh, Tsinghua University, uh, Duyang Institute at CAS, and uh, Wuhan University. And actually, the Wuhan University collaboration was critical because uh, it was with this Institute for Quality Development Strategy. I think that's the right name. Um, and they train a lot of the um, Quality Inspection Bureau officials in Guangdong province, as well as in many other provinces. So they had very good access to local government support, which 
turned out to, after a lot of pretesting and failing, uh, that connection to local government turned out to be critical for getting firms to be willing to cooperate with the survey. So the response rate was, uh, from, from the survey uh, in the end, was about, uh, I think about 80%, 75 to 80% of firms who we um, sampled actually participated in the survey, which is extremely high for uh, firm uh, surveys. Um, and we do have a plan to expand and continue. So tentatively, we are hoping to add a few provinces in 2016 and then to scale up to seven provinces and maybe 2,500 firms or so uh, by 2017. And we're going to try to cover most of the very major uh, manufacturing provinces as well as a few from other parts uh, of the country. Um, so this is hopefully just the, the beginning. The questionnaires in the survey, uh, the firm questionnaire had modules with the following titles. Um, if you're interested in the particular questions, we can, um, we're happy to share the questionnaires. Uh, and most importantly for this paper, um, there was a lot of questions about employment and wages. Um, with detailed breakdowns by skill level, by education level, by types of jobs, um, et cetera, and details on the, on the different um, aspects of turnover of workers, firing, voluntary departures, uh, new hiring of different uh, types of workers. And in the worker questionnaire, uh, we have an enormous amount of question about current jobs, including a battery of task questions of the auteur type, which is to get at tasks, right? This, question that Piotr and other people have been, um, and Sebastian were talking about. Uh, and then uh, it also has a detailed uh, work history, a section on social insurance coverage, and then a section on uh, non-cognitive skills and subjective uh, well-being. Okay, so we, uh, we, you know, we have a fairly large group of researchers from the four uh, partners of the survey looking at a planning to look at a number of different questions. Um, this is kind of the first question because it was kind of the motivating question in some ways for collecting, or at least that we used to get people to pay um, for the survey, including uh, some money from our World Bank support as a network partner. So I also wanted to present this for that reason since this is an uh, event supported by that funder. So Sebastian, you have to go back and tell the people in the jobs group that it was very impressive, and you know everyone was excited. Right? Okay. Okay, that should be plenty. So uh, this is just some description of the sample. Since it's a brand new survey, uh, we stratified the sampling of firms by employment size, so it's pretty good spread. Most of the sample, you know, is larger, over a hundred employees, um, uh, but uh, uh, a pretty good spread. Uh, and then, so because a lot of them are large, I think in the future, hopefully, we'll be able to uh, uh, also link uh, the data to the MBS annual survey of manufacturing, which we haven't done yet, to hopefully get more years. One of the big constraints, limitations at right now for this data is that we, for many variables, we only collected the last two years, uh, 2014 and 2013. So obviously, that significantly hampers the sophistication of kind of uh, using different kind of panel data estimation methods. OK, and th this is a, a rough aggregation of industrial categories of the firms in the sample. And then uh, distribution by ownership. It's almost all private and foreign firms. Uh, Guangdong has very few state-owned enterprises. Um, but this is a very, it's, it's going to be a good data set to look at the difference between foreign invested firms and domestic firms. Um, and also, uh, about 65% of the firms are exporting firms, about two thirds. Guangdong, uh, I think, accounts for something like a third of Chinese exports. So, I mean, it's a huge, it's the huge, of the, you know, China is a factory of the world, but Guangdong is a factory of China. Okay. Um, so, this is just a summary statistics on the firm performance, since we know that. We hear a lot of reports that uh, manufacturing firms in China are struggling recently with the lack of 
kind of global demand given the difficulties that facing Europe and other places. And you can see that um, just taking the means of these basic indicators for the last two years, um, uh, you can see that there is some, uh, there, there, there is a still increase in output and revenue and profit, but there's a lot of heterogeneity. So about you know, one third are reporting less output in 2014 than 2013. Forty percent are, are, are saying that they're getting less profit than before, and uh, about 18 percent said they had negative profits in 2013. 14 percent had negative profits in 2014, and uh, a third are also uh, reporting a decline in revenue. These are the firm managers. I cannot guarantee that they're telling us the truth. Yeah. Um, I don't have a strong gut feeling. Uh, there's a lot of heterogeneity, right? So they're not, of, I mean, I think firms tend to underreport profits. Uh, they try to move things around so profits aren't too high. So I think that's right. Um, but you're going to see these firms are downscaling. Uh, if you look at other things like capital and employment, yeah. Yes. So, but we had a very high response rate. Um, yeah, actually, I talked to someone at the IFC who has done lots of these surveys of private firms in different countries, including China, and she says they will never work with a government department on a survey because they're worried that firms will, are going to lie. But their response rates are like 12%, 17%. I mean, really ridiculously low. Right. Uh, so I'm not. I, I'm not going to defend. You know, all of the honesty of the data, but I do tend to think that uh, if there are biases, the biases kind of occur are pretty consistent, right? So if if even when they're all underreporting, some are underreporting less than others. It's mean the, the variation is still meaningful. In other words. Uh, uh, that's possible. Right. So there's been a fair amount of effort to get the data right. If things don't look funny or, or they didn't report something, then we would send people back during the survey period or call repeatedly afterwards to try to get a better understanding or try to make sure that the, the data uh, is correct. But you know, there's going to be remaining errors. Yeah. Right. OK. That's good. We, we can go through some data, some uh, external validity checks from other sources. Right. All right. So this all kind of just introducing. And then, and then we, uh, we asked uh, subjectively what were the extent to which managers, uh, this is kind of a typical business type survey, right, a style question, um, to what extent they view the following uh, issues or areas as posing barriers to the firm's future development, right? And then this is just the, this is the percentage for the top, uh, the top concern categories, the percent that said that this was creating a prohibitive or very significant kind of factor in terms of being a barrier to the firm's development. And you can see that labor cost is by far the most, uh, has the highest uh, response rate. Seventy percent of firms are, view the rising labor costs as the, as a very serious factor. 
market demand, second, taxation. And then a lot of issues also related to uh, skills of workers, right, um, are all on the list. And then there's a, there's a kind of a longer list. And these are the detailed breakdowns. I won't go into them. But, but the financing and um, policy uncertainty, land regulation, those are less viewed much less important than the ones I showed on the previous slide, which is interesting. OK. Now, when we look, um, when we ask the firm to break down their employment by types of workers, uh, in, we, we divide into these categories. This is the percentages. So about 2 thirds are frontline production workers. Uh, then there's another 4.5% who are other workers who are like guards or people who work in the cafeterias or janitors who don't deal directly with production. 4% salesmen. 7.4% are technical workers, jishu um, And then uh, about 17, 18% are managers, of which 7% are top or mid-level managers. Um, and uh, we're going to do a lot of things breaking down uh, the employment uh, choices by these different types of workers. And since we're focusing kind of on how production is responding to the uh, labor cost changes, when we get down to the regression analysis, we're going to kind of exclude the other workers and the salesmen who aren't directly involved in production and focus on the top mid manager, the managers and the technicians as kind of skilled workers and the production workers as the unskilled workers, okay, just for future reference. Okay. Um, so this is just the mean reported wage changes by worker type from the worker survey. Okay, these are workers reporting, not the firms. Um, and we asked about the monthly wage at the time of the surveys uh, in 2015. So this would be summer 2015. We also asked about the monthly wage at the end of 2014, at the end of 2013. So we have three monthly wage data points for each worker. And we also asked for bonuses at Spring Festival this year, which is for the 2014 year, and bonuses the previous year, 2014, which is really corresponds to the 2013 year of income. Uh, so we can, for 2013-14, we can add in the bonuses and look at the annual income changes uh, from 2013 to 2014. And one thing you can see right away is what we have seen from the aggregate kind of wage data uh, is borne out in the reporting by workers themselves that uh, the salesman is very high here. So this is the 2013 to 14. The green is the annual income. The red is the monthly income is very similar. It's highest for uh, the uh, salesman. But excluding them, it's clearly higher for the production workers than for the skilled workers, right, on average, the managers and the, and the technicians, right? And uh, in from the end of 2014 to the kind of the first half of 2015, uh, the wage increases are much more modest for workers. So the wage pressure seems to have lessened in the first half of this year. Uh, but our analysis is really going to focus on changes from 2013 to 14, which are the two years where we asked the firms to report accounting, uh, accounting data. And then um, you can also see. Um, yeah, so this is just repeating the previous table. Let me go on. Um, if you look at the educational credentials of uh, and the job tenure uh, in the firm of these different types of workers, they're, they're recorded here. If you look at kind of just the college graduate rate, you know, about 40% of managers are college graduates, as well as for technical workers. So they all look kind of similar in their skill profile. Salespersons actually are the most educated. Uh, in the data, although it's a very small percent of our, our sample because I think m many salespersons maybe weren't around during the survey, and then if not, because they are you know, on the road selling things. And so uh, in those cases, we replaced them with another worker. Um, and production workers, z uh, you know, almost 0% are college graduates or below, so they're much more concentrated in the uh, middle school and below, like 65% are middle school or, or less than middle school. Um, and so 
you know, I think it's a reasonable breakdown to call these the skilled workers and these production workers. It corresponds very strongly to the, to the educational credentials. And when you look at, if you put in the kind of occupation types and the level of education together in regression, it's actually the occupation types that matter a lot more than the levels of education. Um, Xiaoxiu Renyuan, how would you, I think that's, and they may be bundled. Okay. Excuse me? Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't noticed that before. Clear casting, <laughs> a very big one. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if all, yeah, I'm not sure how office workers and secretaries, would they be in other workers or would they be somehow in the, I'm not sure, we, we should check that, but yeah, it's interesting. So you think this may be just be office workers, a lot of what we're calling. So that then we should relabel it if that's the case. A little bit misleading. What? Yeah. There's so many women here, but the educational credentials are the same. So becoming the big, the big boss doesn't seem related to your education, even if accounting for the office workers and stuff, even if they're in that category. But th okay, this maybe should be other wh white collar employees or something. Okay. And then, uh, kind of surprisingly to me, uh, there is actually a substantial wage variation, uh, ac variation across cities in the increased rates of wages. Um, so one, uh, one concern, uh, this is going to be important because one concern of collecting data where we have just a couple of Um, so, uh, is, uh, the concern is that collecting data for just a couple of years in one part of China, you might not have any wage variation to really explain differences across firms in response. And so we're going to use the city variation in the wages as kind of the most exogenous source of variation I think that we can get. Um, so we're going to calculate city specific, skill specific wage changes. Um, at, at the city level as kind of the wages that different firms are confronting and look at those variations to identify effects later. So even after uh, we control for um, sector, firm characteristics and whatnot, these city differences really persist. So um, that's kind of in some ways a puzzle for me, I mean, to try to understand better what's to what extent uh, the labor markets really are separate labor markets. There's, of course, a lot of literature both in China and the U.S. about regional labor markets, which argue that they're, you know, they're not perfectly integrated, of course. Um, so maybe that's uh, a reasonable assumption. Okay. This is the overall adjustment of uh, employment from 2013 to 2014. And you can see that for the firms as a whole, there's a reduction in employment over this period, over this one-year period. And it's concentrated in uh, the production workers. We see uh, increased hiring of managers, kind of flat for technicians. So overall, an increase in skilled worker employment, a decrease in unskilled worker employment. So that's consistent kind of with a story of skill upgrading. <clears throat> um, and again, you see enormous variation 
in the percentage of firms that are increasing their employment and decreasing employment. In fact, exactly balanced in the data. Half the firms are increasing employment, half the firms are decreasing employment. Um, and, you know, it, it differs for different types of workers. For production workers, there's more that are decreasing than increasing. Uh, and for the managers, there's more that are increasing than uh, decreasing. Um, and then this is a plot of the employment change by sector. Okay, so the labor intensive sector, textile leather is decreasing much more than the others. Electronic devices too, the others are more mixed. Um, and also a lot of variation by city. So these are the 13 cities that we did surveys in. Okay. Um, one other possible response of firms is to outsource production. And we definitely met firms which said uh, it's too expensive to produce here, so they're either setting, investing in another factory in a cheaper part of China in the interior, or, or they're uh, subcontracting some of their production to a firm that they work with out there, et cetera. But if you look at the results of the, the survey, it isn't very much, okay? So 90% plus are, have, have, are, are, are producing just in this district. And then the percent reporting, even if they're not producing in this district where their firm is located, uh, some of them are in another city in Guangdong or another city in the district. The percent saying they're actually going to another province or foreign or subcontract is, is really small in this data. But of course, we're not following firms who shut down operations and move completely. We're only covering firms who are still producing or doing some production in the area. But still, we thought that might be an interesting um, type of response, but, but no evidence of that. Okay, so let me go. And then the other thing is, even if we, even if we control for sector and city dummies, um, uh, we still see this significant difference in the increased rate of wages for unskilled workers compared to uh, the skilled workers. All right, so uh, we're gonna look at, in the regression, look at is employment responding to wage changes and what factors are intermediating the responsiveness of employment to wages captured, used by interaction terms. And so this is a, a specification explaining different firm responses. We're gonna focus on changes in employment, both overall and of skilled workers and unskilled workers. And then we're interested in this term, kind of how is it responding to wages? We're going we're to use city skill specific wages and then interact that with some firm characteristics. Also see if it's corresponding to changes in capital. Um, and then control for all the lagged values. And this, is, this specification can be derived from a firm optimization problem, assuming constant returns of scale. And these lags account for adjustment costs, or these, yeah. Uh, and uh, everything else I've said, these are the firm characteristics we're going to look at. The base year employment, so all in, in the base year in 2013, uh, the level of employment, the share of unskilled workers in employment, whether the firm is exporting, and then whether you know, its ownership and its profitability in, in 2013, and then sector dummies. Um, and one of the weaknesses is that so far we haven't really controlled for city level variation so the, the wage variable we're using is a city level variable. We can't put in city fixed effects and we have not put in other city controls yet. And we kind of, because we have some limited years of data, we can't really do more sophisticated GMM or other, other methods. But I think even though this is not that well identified right now, the effective wage change is if there's bias, is probably gonna work against us finding a response. Because if you think that there's some unobserved demand shock that is kicking up wages in certain areas, that should lead to expanding employment. And we're expecting a negative effect, right, if it's truly exogenous. So that should work against us. Most of the unobserved stories or endogenous stories would probably work against finding a response, a negative response of employment to higher wages. Okay, so this is the results for overall employment. And you can see there's quite a response to changes in the unskilled wage, not so much to the city skilled wage. This is total employment. And uh, this is total employment. And we find actually that all the action and the statistically significant action is, is in the unskilled workers, but the coefficient is of similar sign actually for skilled workers as well as unskilled workers. So that suggests it's not some kind of upgrading, it's that when firms are facing a higher unskilled wage, they're just scaling down, right, employment. 
Um, and then uh, when we interact this change in the city unskilled wage with other firm characteristics, uh, which we do kind of one at a time, and we find that the only one that is consistently significant is this uh, exporting dummy. So exporting firms, if you look at this combined with this, they're much less responsive to wage changes than non-exporting firms, basically. And that may make sense if they're connected to uh, global value chains where they have to meet their quantity <laughs> requirements or they have contracts, export contracts, where the quantities are set you know, in previous years. And of course, we don't have the lags to, to be able to look at that uh, directly. But the other ones don't work, uh, don't show significantly right now. Okay, and then uh, we can also do this separately for the, um, for the unskilled employment. The previous one was total employment. It's also the responses are bigger. And uh, again, it's the exporting dummy that is significant. Okay. We also looked at the responsiveness of skilled worker employment and the change in capital to wage changes, and there was no evidence of any responsiveness to the changes in wages. And so that suggests that the main response so far is this ne kind of this negative effect, right? That um, rising unskilled wages leads to downsizing, um, and there's no evidence that you're going to increase the skilled workers or capital to compensate. Okay. So that's it. Um, let me just say a word about next steps. Uh, you know, we need to do a lot more work, obviously. Uh, we'd like to look at other, uh, more specific aspects of the firm's response in terms of hiring, firing, voluntary departures. Look more, there's a number of things about investment, uh, details about the types of investment that we have, and also R&D, uh, different measures that we can also uh, look at more closely. And we also obviously need to refine the analysis to better address some of the endogeneity issues and some of the robustness issues. Hopefully we can, we have an incredible detail on the skill of the workers in the firms from the worker sample. So we can also really do a lot to control for, uh, uh, look more closely at different types of uh, uh, skill dimensions as well. And hopefully we can extend the panel by linking it to the MBS data. So thank you very much. Albert kindly showed me, or at least Heard again the questioner. I think the greatest thing about this survey badly needed. It hasn't been a survey that's been done of this sort. Survey again, certainly what's been done now and what we've done. By this time. So, what's going on? Certainly, we're going to. The kinds of things that are going on here in Guangdong. Albert kind of alluded to the problems that these firms in Guangdong are facing parts of the country. Aren't new problem. These wages have been rising for relatively long. So I can certainly remember at first, probably at least 10, 12 years ago, being in, in Dongguan and other places uh, in, Gu in Guangdong where these firms were talking about the kinds of problems that they were facing in the labor markets and the kinds of adjustments uh, that they were needing to make again as a result. One of the things I think that we need to do is that when we're taking a look in terms of what's going on, both the pressures that these firms are facing, and it's not only pressures that they're facing in the labor market here, but it's also pressures that they're facing in terms of product markets. At the extent of the increasing competition that these firms are facing, both from other firms in China, if you're, and here we're talking about a sample of firms where a lot of them are exporters, they're facing a lot of competition, again, from low-wage countries, particularly, again, from, from Vietnam. So these pressures are not just confined, again, to labor markets. They're also, confirmed, you know, they're also going to be coming through the product market as well. And both of these things, again, are just going to be extremely important. And so at least from my perspective, and so I'm one of the, I guess, someone who kind of looks at this both from the data end and having spent far much more time than I'd ever care to admit in terms of trying to assemble, again, these firm-level databases. But I would imagine that over the last maybe 10 or 12 years, I've probably visited, I don't know, 350, 400 firms. And so my kind of perspective, again, increasingly is kind of inside out. I want to know what's going on with these firms. I want to know what's going on with the sectors. I want to know what's going on kind of with the dynamics of competition. Uh, but this kind of top-down, more broader kind of data analysis is extremely good. But I think we really need to kind of get inside the black box, again, of these firms in terms of what they're doing. And so that when we talk, again, about these firms upgrading, well, what exactly does that mean? There's all kinds of ways in which these firms can upgrade. They can certainly innovate in terms of, there's all kinds of cost innovation, and Chinese firms have been unbelievably good in terms of 
themselves, again, finding ways to lower cost, or we see cost innovation, again, throughout the value chain. There's all kinds of product innovation that we happen to be seeing as well, both in terms of product innovation, both kind of on a, what we might refer to as functional upgrading, where at least in terms of the value chain or in terms of a, of a, of a product, the subsystems that firms, again, are producing are becoming increasingly more uh, complex. Or it may just be that firms are producing and developing new or slightly modified products. Those are both very different ways in which firms, again, can go ahead and can upgrade and kind of deal with the competition uh, that they happen to be facing. More generally, in lots of these firms here, is that what we see is that we see firms expanding, again, their kind of capabilities in terms of what they do. And so one of the first times that I guess I was kind of became aware of this, I was visiting a, a company, and they were manufacturing shirts for Brooks Brothers, uh, which is relatively well known, and they were also manufacturing dresses for Ann Taylor, which is a relatively high-end uh, women's store. You know, when they first began manufacturing for uh, Ann Taylor, they were basically importing everything, you know, all the fabric, everything was coming in, all that they were basically doing was the sewing. They began to realize that the margins are beginning to come down, and so they tell, you know, Ann Taylor, tell the people in New York, you know, rather than importing the material, how about if you let us, let us go ahead and begin to source the material locally? By the time it was done, and this all happened within a period of about probably no more than three or four years, after the end of three or four years, what was basically going on is that there was some designer in New York that was sending this company just literally a sketch. That was it, just a sketch again of a dress. What they were doing is that you know, they had the CAD machines that they could go ahead and they could then draw the patterns for it. And then, basic, then on the basis of whatever the price points were again for New York, they would just go ahead and they would negotiate and, and that would be it. But basically everything other than that sketch had moved. Now, certainly from the point of view of the data and the way in which we might look at that firm, that was just an apparel firm. But that firm itself, in terms of the capabilities that had been developed within that firm, had changed radically. And so that's the kind of thing that when I take a look at firms from kind of the inside out, I see that going on again and again and again. In the most successful firms, most successful sectors, that's what's going on. And so I think it just kind of raises these kinds of questions about how are these firms upgrading? And in turn, what are the requirements? Because the kinds of requirements, again, to be able to do each of these kinds of things differ uh, in lots of ways. I think the second thing is that if we want to get inside this kind of black box of these firms, I think Albert alluded to it, we just have information, or you have information for two years, over time you'll get a lot more. We're really talking about short run versus long run adjustments. And these again can be very, very different because often again a lot of these firms, they're going to move into areas in which you and I may not even be able to kind of anticipate, right? So that there's going to be things that they're going to be able to do in the short run, long run, certainly deeper investments, larger investments, both in terms of, certainly in terms of capital, certainly in terms of investments in R&D, all kinds of things. As well, and I guess that Al Albert in some sense kind of addressed this, that when I first kind of looked at the slides, is I think that there is, and, and maybe less here in Guangdong, there is a lot of heterogeneity in production workers. And so that maybe less so again in this particular sample, but you will, you will see firms where basically everybody who happens to be working has no more than nine years of education. But if you were to go ahead and to visit a firm like Shang, uh, Shanghai Tungyong, Shanghai GM, Take a look at those people who are working on the assembly line. All of them have a college education or better. So these things that we call these production workers, there's an enormous, again, amount of heterogeneity. There's certainly sorting that's going on in terms of these firms and in terms of the kinds of things that they happen to be doing. Some of the, the Taiwanese or even the Hong Kong companies that have been here in Guangdong, they are typically often doing very labor-intensive kinds of assembly where they had no more than nine years of, of education. And those are going to be the kinds of firms that are going to be most exposed, again, to the rising wages that we happen to see. But I think that in order to kind of, from a, certainly from a policy end, we need to find ways to get inside this black box. The other thing that here, we're, a lot of what we're looking here on the labor side, we're just focusing on the, kind of on the supply side. I think what's equally important to what these firms are doing and to the kind of upgrading choices that they're making has to do with what's going on on the demand side. And in the, in the survey, it kind of comes up where firms are talking about market demand. You know, when these firms are trying to make decisions about how to go ahead and to upgrade, it really has to be in light of what they perceive to be market opportunities out there. And so if I go ahead and if I invest in terms of upgrading, producing a better product, am I going to actually find customers that are going to be willing to pay me the premium that it took me to be able to produce that higher quality product? And so that although you see a lot of that going on, there's also an awful lot of sectors in China where that's not going on. And it, it has a lot to do in way in which product markets happen to be working, 
um, about the, even in some sense, how competitive certain kinds of product markets happen to be being. So if we want to be looking at these upgrading decisions, we also have to be looking at the demand side that these firms happen to be facing, because that's defining the opportunities for these firms to kind of move up the ladder. But then in turn, there's going to be all these kind of adjustments that these firms are going to be making on the supply side in terms of labor and other kinds of investments. And these are kind of highly complementary. You've got to look at both of these to be able to, to make sense. The last point that I want to make, and this is just something I think that I've argued in, in other contexts, has to do kind of, the, kind of the external adjustments. When you take a look at productivity in Chinese manufacturing, it turns out that certainly the estimates that we've made that probably two-thirds of all the productivity is coming from new firms. And that you have these new firms that are entering the productivity distribution just at productivity levels that are higher than the incumbents. And so they're extremely important, again, to the productivity dynamics that we happen to observe. Here's some estimates. So this is just taken from that business registry. So this is kind of the universe uh, of all firms. And so we've used that then to go ahead and to construct then estimates from 1998 up through 2013 in terms of kind of entry rates of firms, uh, exit rates, and, and net entry. And so one of the things that you see here is that in terms of new firm dynamics, entry rates are really very high. And so they've consistently, again, been very high. Now, there may be some small issues, again, about measurement and about the way in which the the uh, Ministry of Industry and Commerce have been kind of consistently registering firms, but these are very high rates of, of, of entry, and these things are corroborated by other kind of data that we happen to have. Exit has, in fact, been actually declining over time. I don't know if, in fact, that's just kind of an administrative kind of thing, whether it actually reflects what's going on. But this margin here is an extremely important adjustment that we happen to see in sectors, both in terms of the extent to which poorer, weaker firms are exiting, but we're continually seeing, again, in almost in each and every sector, we're seeing new firms entering. And these firms are typically entering with very different kinds of skill sets and other kinds of decisions as others. So I think that this kind of margin is also extremely important, again, to the kinds of things that we happen to see. So, but in general, I'm just going to, uh, in some sense, be a plug for Albert. I think this is a great survey. I think it's got a lot of insight in terms of, of what's going on. So I uh, look forward to seeing what will be done then. Uh, Guys make more progress. Thanks. So I was uh, struck by the the relative wage of the unskilled versus skilled that happens after around 2008, and then also the heterogeneity in terms of the rise of the the, the unskilled wage across cities, and also the slowdown in 2014 and 15. I'm wondering whether this rise in the seems to suggest that a lot of this rise in unskilled wage has to do with the government policy, the investment uh, in infrastructure, increased demand for unskilled labor, the construction, and now with the slowdown in the government investment and also probably the cooling down of the real estate market, uh, this 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 rise in in the demand for unskilled workers may may, may change. And then we may we may not see a dramatic continued increase at, at, at that rate anyway of the unskilled wages. Yeah, this is very lovely. You know, I I I just want to learn a bit more about uh, a little bit more details. For example, on the employment side, you know, wh whether we know a little bit more about the number of shift. Uh, firms, you know, uh, you know, on average have, and the uh, workers' average hours, you know, on average, you know, like you know, how much you know those have ch changed, and uh, in terms of wage, I also want to see whether uh, we can take into account the, of the experience, more experienced workers versus you know, like you know, uh, you know, like new newly hired workers, and if they are downsizing, you know, who got cut, you know, more. So actually, my question is um, related to what we see yesterday about the labor share and the conversation with Lauren. So what I feel, maybe because I'm outside the area, I'm quite puzzled. Why, if the labor share is so low, about 0.20, you know, or even lower, you know, um, and given Chinese use technology that is so labor intensive, so lots of uh, revenue is going somewhere. So. With such low labor share, 
why is the rising labor cost the main concern? You know, the thing is, there must be something stopping even more costly for the firm to be created in the first place. You know, and I'm even more shocked now that I see this picture, because you know, if rising labor costs and 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 given before it was already labor is getting so little. So what happened to the profits of the firm? You know, something something more complete on the all the factors of production and the entry side. How easy for firm to entry? Is it because they already pay a lot ex ante? That's why rising labor cost is making a difference. But then it should reflect in the fall in entry rates. But we don't see here. So I'm completely puzzled. Any other question? Okay. Just more one question related to the survey on, on the type of questions on on is there any information on on organizational changes that the firm like have undergone like more total quality management process in, incorporated in it or so that you can see if this has been also uh, a process of uh, or delaying or decentralization or like is there any information on that? Um, let me kind of go backwards, it's easy to remember. So in this question, uh, we do have a module in the firm question about quality control. So there actually are uh, some questions related to it. We didn't explicitly include kind of Van Rienen type management questions because their survey style seemed very intensive <laughs> and we weren't sure how well it would adapt to a questionnaire based method, although uh, since then I've seen actually that it has been done in other places, so we, we may do that in, in future ways. But I think we have some stuff on quality management, what the firm is doing, because our our partners at Wuhan are from the Institute of Quality, you know, they work with these quality inspections, so they actually included a module which we kind of didn't pay any attention to, but then we actually, turns out it may be useful actually for, for these kinds of issues. Um, minimum wages among it's not a big issue in Guangdong. The minimum wage in Guangdong is like 1,600. If you go to Guangdong, the cheapest salary for anything being advertised for janitors and whatnot is gonna be over 3,000. So I don't think it tends to be a binding wage in, 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 in these areas. Um, so we, we had a bunch of questions about minimum wage initially, but we ended up dropping them from, <laughs> from the survey. Yeah, we can, we will. Yeah, we we, can, we know what the way we know what the minimum wages are everywhere, and we know what they're saying they're making, so we can see if it, it's binding for uh, for different work. Um, and then, uh, so Rachel's question about what's going on: why is labor cost a concern? I, it's really interesting to me too, because uh, for many years in China, I think wages were not growing up nearly as fast as productivity. Like wages were somewhat flat, while product so firms were just benefiting, and now it's the opposite. I mean, those increases we're seeing, I think, are faster than overall growth or value-added growth. So they're definitely paying more. So whether it's gotten to the point where now it's starting to become an issue or not, of course, those rates of increase are gonna eventually, <laughs> especially for the labor-intensive firms. Those are the ones who suffer more. Some firms actually will also tell you we're not worried about the wage levels that our biggest issue is, especially for the more skilled firms, they're much more worried about finding and retaining good workers. Um, and they say, we'll pay them whatever uh, whatever we need to to keep them. And those firms tend to see less uh, turnover and whatnot. Um, so I think it's a reasonable question to ask whether this is really an issue for all firms. I think it is for some firms, but, but, but that varies quite a bit. Um, then, uh, Ping, your questions, I think those are exactly the kinds of questions we want to get into. We have the data to do it, so we can describe work hours and movements across firms. One issue we have, of course, is that we have no data on workers who have left, right? And it's hard, even from the firms, we, it's hard for us to collect data on workers who have left or retrospectively, at, even at the firm level. So, um, but we can certainly, uh, track our current set of workers, and as workers leave, we'll know if they left, because we'll follow them over, over time into the, uh, into the future. Um, then, uh, so Lauren's questions, I'm not sure there were many real questions. I think they were more about suggesting 
things uh, things to do in the future. And I think that's right. I mean, this idea of um, you have to find demand opportunities, and that's going to really drive whether you. Um, I think we have to think about how we can measure that or ask them about that. Um, so that would be the main challenge. I think you're 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 absolutely right. But if you have any suggestions on how to implement, um, so we can deal address that issue better, uh, it would be great. Um, so let me stop there. Thanks.